Well, good morning. It is good to look out and see so many here with us this morning, ready and eager to study from the Master's pages, from the words of truth that are our scriptures. And we are so glad all of you all are here this morning. I was talking uh, last Wednesday night with uh, those in the command module. No, those in the back here at the, uh, at the boards, uh, I think it was Lanny and maybe Brent and Kyler and maybe some others that were standing around back. And I went, <sighs> and they all went <sighs> at the same time. And I said, you know, even Jesus sighed. And they all looked at me and I said, I have a sermon on that. And they said, really, we'd like to hear that. So that's what I'm going to preach about, the sermon, Even Jesus Sighed. Jesus sighed a number of times throughout the scriptures. And when we look at sighing for what it is, we start out by saying, sighing is not whining. And when I go to the very last portion of the lesson, you'll see what I mean by that. But sighing is the idea of going, ha. Ah. And just, it, it's an expression that we have. It's something that we naturally do, sometimes even taking a deep breath and uh, taking a, uh, an exhalation of breath will actually help us reduce stress in various times. But Jesus particularly sighed or particularly had sighs at a various number of different things. And so when we talk about this morning, the sighs of Jesus, these are not instances where Jesus was whining um, there's no clicker up here. You guys are going to have to advance through these, so I'll just point to you. The size of Jesus, um, he sighed at the non-heavenly mind. Uh, he sighed at the testing of God by man. He sighed at turning tell me into show me religion. He sighed at truth dismissal from fellow disciples. Thank you so much, Brent. And then he also sighed at the last time at a time when sometimes his sighs or his, oh, I wish you understood this, would evoke positivity. So he would say a sigh and that type of sigh would evoke positivity such as the men on the road to Emmaus. And so there are a number of different types of sighs in the Bible. Exasperation occurred when Jesus dealt with folks like us who are not composed of perfectly heavenly faith or perfectly heavenly qualities. It doesn't reduce Jesus' love for us to know that we are not just like him in perfect heavenly quality. It doesn't reduce his love one iota, but it does irritate him in the scriptures from time to time that we are so unlike the ones in heaven. From time to time, we are so unlike the ones in heaven. As much as we falter, it's not really a surprising thing that Jesus says things like, how much do I have to deal with all of this spiritual, spiritual, immature activity? I was at a science center in Lubbock, Texas with my family once, and many kids were running around showing their respective parents things, saying, what is this? And do you know this and this? And they were like, look at this, I see, and they would go to different hands-on activities and show them what they saw. But then all these kids crowded into a science show where a real scientist was going to talk to them about things. Not a show hands-on thing where they got to like uh, hold a lot of things, but they got to see a real scientist give a real demonstration that would require sitting down and not going around playing or not running around. There were about 85 people out of the 100 theater audience that left the show. It was rude. They just slowly trickled out. Like four would walk out of the room, then five more than, oh, he's kind of can't sit still. So then 10 would walk out. 65 of them kept going. And at the end, there were like 20. And then at the very end of the program, uh, the scientist had the people who actually stayed through the whole show come forward and look at the hawk or the falcon and come look at some of the bubble things that they were doing with steam and look at the various things. Our kids might remember this. They sat through it. So, uh, you know, you might see the things that they wanted to demonstrate at the end, but there was a time of tell from the chief scientists. Not so much show, but tell. And we'll talk about them, that in a minute. The ratios may not be the same in those numbers, 
uh, from ratio to ratio, but that is how grown people behave in spiritual activity. Jesus says, how long must I endure? And the people here on this planet are often childish and not childlike. Some are good natured, but they are few. And the reality is most of the world's grown men and women go away from hearing about the heavenly things. They don't want to hear heavenly things. So they trickle out of churches and attend maybe three times a year. If they're, if they're really uh, akin to feeling some sort of level of guilt or something or, or intention to do well. But Jesus wonders, how much longer must I endure with you? This is explained in Mark chapter 9, verse 19, where we'll go to for our first scripture of the morning. He says, how is this that I must deal with you? He says, you unbelieving generation, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer which I must endure you? Bring him to me before he heals one. And so in Mark 9, 19, we see this representation of him going, oh, how much longer? And you can sense the sigh there. He sighs at the non-heavenly mind. And Jesus sighs at that. And so if we were to turn to to that, we'd understand that. Skipping along now to another time, Jesus sighed at the testing of God by man. People who put God to the test will consistently exasperate Jesus, and he sighs at those who have already made up in their mind what they think the way of spiritual things should be. If they said, this is my, I already know what it's supposed to be. This is spirituality. This is how it's supposed to be. I know what it is. Granted, there is always a right answer or a right answer to what is lawful, but it's contingent on what Christ says and not the peculiarities of folks in this world's doctrine. Mark chapter 3, verses 2 through 6, especially verse 5 says, People sought to see if he would heal them on the Sabbath so that they could accuse him. Quote, verse 3, So he said to the man who had the withered hand, Stand up among all these people. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath, to heal or to destroy, to save or life or to destroy life? Is that lawful? And they were silent. After looking around the, 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 the crowd in anger, grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out thy hand, and his hand was restored. So the Pharisees went out immediately and began plotting with the Herodians how they might kill him. <laughs> it's so interesting. <sighs> He's sighing that they'll get what's right. He's saying, can I heal on the Sabbath? I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I'm able to do spiritual things on the Sabbath. You guys do all sorts of things on the Sabbath, and I want to heal somebody. And he says, stretch out your hand. And so in his grief by the hardness of their hearts, you can see where he sighs when they strive to test him. We test God. We shouldn't, but we do. We put God to the test, and we should not do that. And here Jesus sighed with the generation while he was there recognizing they were putting him to the test. But at the same time, we need to recognize we don't need to put God to the test. We need to say, I am like clay. You are the potter. Oh, Lord, I know my strength indeed is small. Lest I should lead, I'm prone to slip and fall. Guide and direct or evil help me stand, Lord, Make me as clay in the potter's hand. Let's let you mold us and make us to be what we need to be and not try to test God and such, but to do what he wants us to do. Sighing deeply in his spirit, we see another way. We could say that third, we come to our emphatic thesis. <laughs> thesis idea of the main topic of the point. This is the verse we read in our scripture reading, and you may have missed it if you weren't listening real carefully, because often in the scripture reading, uh, we, we hear part of the scripture, but maybe didn't catch the beginning. And so in Mark 8, oh, I'm not there yet. <laughs> in uh, uh, third, we're going to look at this idea of, of Mark 8, 12. So jot down Mark 8, 12 and... Take the verse Matthew 4.12 and, and change it. I was up here talking to, uh, what was it, uh, I guess it would have been Mike Stivers. He came up here and he said, 
He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm giving Robert the right scripture reading because I put the wrong one on the board. He goes, good, you caught it before the lesson. He said, sometimes you get up there and forget to catch it before the lesson. You go, why did the wrong one? Well, so I gave him the scripture reading to Mark 4.12 and he read the right one. And so when we look at Mark 8.12, if you're jotting down notes, you can change that to Matthew 4.12 to Mark 8.12. So if you're taking notes... Mark 8, 12 has a cross-reference in John 16, 29. But anyways, this is the emphatic thesis with this verse. It's the main point to show it's okay to sigh from time to time. To go, what is this season that we're going through right now? Tax season. We got ours done. We got them filed. Got them sent to the accountant. Got that part done. But I tell you, up to that point, we're just going, oh boy, we're going to get this done. And so it's it's a time where we all sigh. It's a time where everybody in America sighs to try to get it done. Even the accountants that are trying to get it done. I'm sure Pam sighs through her work a lot. Oh, she had big eyes. They bowled out. Yeah, so everybody's sighing at this time. I was trying to talk uh, about to sermon preparation with one of my uh, uh, fellow friends, and they said, uh, uh, well, what are you going to preach about? And I said, well, it's tax season. I could do a series on giving, but nobody wants to hear that at this time of year. So I'm going to I'm going to put that back and talk about sighing, something that that we that we relate to. Jesus sighed in spirit, and he said, you know, why does this generation look for a sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to this generation. He's not going to show them all sorts of things uh, that they want to see. Like that illustration of the kids at the Science Center, the kids at the Science Center want to get their hands on stuff because they're little kids, want to do things. I get that. That's understandable. But we're the same way. We say, God, if you could just show me a sign, if I could just see some sort of miraculous outpouring, if I could just see, see something you've done, where instead he says, I've told you a lot already. I don't need to see so much stuff that you see. I need you to listen to the things I'm telling you. Those speeches that we hear of someone, a beloved loved one who's right there getting ready to pass from this life, we lean in to hear what do they have to say. They say it so frailly. They say it so feebly. They say it so in muted tones, but we all lean in to hear what our loved ones have to say because when it's a dying wish, it's important. When it's something that's right on their lips, we don't say, oh, are they going to give a big speech and give me something? No, we just want to hear those words from them. And that's what Jesus did for us on the cross when he talks to us. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus teaches us through the scriptures and he gives us information. And God says his last dying wish for us today is for us to listen to him because his son resurrected from the grave. That is enough sign that should show anybody. Like he said, the only sign that will be given is the sign of Jonah, the idea of someone three days in the earth and then resurrected. He says, if they don't believe in the resurrection, they're not going to believe in any sign. He says, that's the only sign they really need to see. And what's interesting in our generation, we don't see the miracles. We don't see the guy with the withered hand getting stretched forth and him being able to write. We don't see the stories of someone who can't walk and all of a sudden they're jumping around and leaping in the temple. We see the resurrection and he tells us that's our sign. If you believe in that, that's wonderful. That's all you really need to believe as far as faith is concerned regarding signs in our generation. Jesus wasn't a magician. He wasn't a rock star. He wasn't an orator per se, although he talked a lot. The men of Galilee were focused on religious things. That's what he did most of the time was go around and talk about religious things. And he told them stories. He told them parables that the little kids could understand. He talked about fish and he talked about trees and he talked about uh, sheep and he talked about uh, doors and he talked about all sorts of things they could get and understand. Much of what he did was just talk. He was a parable speaker and a sermon giver. He wanted to give sermons and talk to people and help them about their souls. And it wasn't just about showing his power, which he could have done. He could have healed everybody. There could have been no blind people. There could have been no deaf people. There could have been no handicaps or maladies in the world. But he chose some to heal, to show his power. But nevertheless, in heaven, there won't be any of those maladies. But there will be discussions with Jesus. And he talked. When our religion has turned only to our eyes... Instead of our ears, we are in great danger. 
often he says, listen, listen, listen. The proverb writer had it right when he said, the seeing eye and the hearing ear, the Lord hath made them both. God didn't just give us religion just so we could see the power of God. He gave us spiritual things so we would listen to understand. He is giving us a discerning book whereby we can learn. <sighs> Sighing deeply in spirit. Robert, good reading. Not, <laughs> poor people, can't believe what they did. I just don't like these people. Lord, I don't want to save him. No, that was whining if it was like that. He didn't whine like that. It says, sighing deeply in spirit, he said, why does this generation look for a sign? I tell you the truth, no sign except the sign of Jonah is going to be given this generation. His disciples said, look, now you're speaking plainly unto us and not an obscure figure of speech. Now we know that you know everything and do not need anyone to ask you anything. Because of this, we believe that you have come from God. Verse 31 of John 16, Jesus replied, do you now believe? Look, a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered, each one to his own home, and I will be left alone. Yet, really, truly, I am not alone because my Father is with me. So he gives them the point saying, I'm not going to be alone, but all you guys are going to scatter. R.D. had a great point about that in class, a really good point about Peter, the idea of scattering soon when he said, oh, I'll be with you. And so this basic point is just to say, we shouldn't just be looking for miracles from God. We should be looking in his scriptures so that the reformation of our life and character, it'll look like a miracle to the rest in the world because most people in the world in no way, shape or form would do anything spiritual to reform their life so much, to look so holy. In fact, they will say, are you behaving holier than thou? Because what they really mean is you're being more religious than me. And so the concept there is the idea of saying, it's almost like a miracle. It isn't a miracle, but it's almost like a miracle when someone does reform their life in such a holy way that it would be based on what they've been told instead of what they have observed from Jesus literally. Fourth, it irritated Jesus when the apostles didn't believe in their fellow apostles who conveyed that Jesus was right in what he taught and what was right was brought to fruition. Do you remember when Jesus arose? So he died, he buried, then he arose. We talk about that. He arose from the grave. Mary saw him. Uh, the apostles saw him in an upper room, but there was one of the apostles. His name was Thomas. He wasn't there. And so later he, he appeared when he was there. And, um, there were a number of those that weren't there, and it says he appeared to the eleven themselves while they were eating, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they didn't believe those who had seen him resurrected, Mark 16, 14. Don't we often talk about Thomas and say, oh, Thomas didn't believe. He said, unless I see the hand prints of his nails and his feet or side, I won't believe. But here's Jesus saying, well, here's all the other apostles. I'm rebuking them because they didn't believe Mary. They didn't believe her when she went out and saw him. Now, Peter and John did because they raced there and raced back. But it says when he appeared to them, he rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they didn't believe. Jesus is telling us we need to believe our fellow disciples when they tell us the truth. If we dismiss the truth from our fellow disciples when they're telling us the truth, in this passage, he's saying that's dismissing him because he was who they were trying to say has, has risen. I'm just going to pause there for a minute. They say, well, how do I know they're telling me the truth? How do I know what they're saying is right? If it aligns with Scripture and it's something they're telling you that's right, maybe it's for your best interest. Maybe it's something for me. Maybe it's something for you. I wish they get it. Next point. There was a road to Emmaus. It went from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And there were two men that were walking on the road to Emmaus. Cleopas and another unmentioned one. And as they were walking, 
as they were walking, they met a man who was walking with them. And he walked alongside them. And they were downtrodden, not feeling well, not having a good day. You could read it on their face. And Jesus said, what's wrong? And they say, well, there was a man by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And our friends and us, we believed in him and we thought he might be the Messiah who is to come. And some of our lady friends of the company, Mary and another one, went to the tomb and it was open. And there was no body in the tomb. The tomb was open. The grave clothes were all, all wrapped up and the, the, the head covering was all folded nicely. There was nobody in the tomb. They spoke of him being risen, but it's all commotion today. We do not know what's gone on, why he's not there. And everybody's asking, if someone stole the body, please let us know, because we want to know where we can properly, uh, you know, treat the one that was there, because he was crucified, and he shouldn't have been crucified. And, and the man on the road, he turns to them and he says, who are you talking about? And he says, what are you like the only person in all of the world who doesn't know who Jesus is? You've not heard the story of Jesus? Where are you from? And he says, oh, sighing, slow of heart, slow of understanding. Do you not remember all the things the prophets have said through the years about this Jesus? Do you not remember that he said he would die, would be buried, and would rise the third day? Do you not remember how he would not comfort us and bring us good hope? And all the walk, the 10 mile or so walk from Emmaus to Jerusalem or vice versa, he walked with them. And it says in the phraseology of, I believe it's Luke 24, it says, did not our hearts just burn within us? They had zeal. It was like sitting around a campfire with a speaker, and they didn't know this guy, but he uplifted them and made them feel good. Oh, guys, how slow of heart are you? Don't you understand who Jesus is, really? And he sighed within himself, and it evoked these guys to positivity. They were no longer looking downtrodden. They were looking up, and then immediately his countenance changed, his vision changed, his presence changed, the bodily image he was in, showed them what Jesus looked like before, and they went, it's Jesus, and poof, he vanished from their sight, and these little fellas ran as fast as they could back to the other guys the whole 10 miles back, going, he appeared to us on the road. And they're like, what, the, Jesus appeared to you on the road? It's like, yes, his size with us evoked real positivity. He got us to recognize what we needed to recognize. Jesus is back. He sees us. He cares about us. And we're downtrodden when things aren't just, just, just what we'd want them to be. He can uplift us through his power and through his beloved nature. I have one more point. And the lesson will be yours, and you may say, well, this is a shorter lesson, but not really. This last point is the contra point to the lesson, the, the opposite point. <sighs> Sighing. Sometimes sighs are good, like Jesus going, I guess these guys don't get it. The, I, the Lord's supposed to die, be buried, and raise again. But if the tomb is empty, that means he's resurrected. Isn't that a good thing? Doesn't that mean he's going to heaven and will bring you with him? See, he knows that, and that's just like a, like a sigh of, I guess i got to explain it to him, but when they actually hear what it is, they're going to love this because they get the hope of heaven too. So his sighs evoke positivity, but sometimes we sigh for the wrong thing. <sighs> Man, I didn't get to do what I wanted to do, and it's really the only thing that really matters is what I want to do, and I don't really care about what they have to say. Well, that's bordering on this next statement. That's bordering on whining. There's a difference between sighing and whining. Whining is the idea of a constant complaint or an instant complaint. Some whines go prolonged for a very long period of time. Other periods of whining are just an instantaneous whining. It rains on our parade, so to speak. How many times have we had an event? The event was planned, literal parades, even in Cabot. It, just, it rained, and they couldn't have the parade. They had to move it to the next week, or it snowed, and they couldn't have that event. 
or some things are just specific to one day or one hour or one moment, and then other times they're prolonged. The size of Jesus, the times he went, oh, they're just wanting a sign. They just want show me religion instead of tell me religion. Or, oh, I just wish that they would understand this is for their own good, or various types of size were just that. But he never whined. He never complained to the point where he said, Lord, these poor people, or Lord, I can't stand what they're doing, or whining, 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 and complaining. Someone says, well, I don't really see a scripture in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, where it really says whining is wrong. Well, actually, there is a scripture, and it goes like this. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Now, we often say we quote book, chapter, verse, right? There is no specific thou shalt not whine because it's a whole book. In Exodus, they're leaving the, the, the Egypt and they're whining, chapter 1 through 3. In Exodus 20, they get the Ten Commandments. They get ten good commandments. But from Exodus 21 through the end of the book, the next thou shalt not, and then all of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy is thou shalt not whine. He tells them over and over. Why are you complaining so much? Over and over and over. I tell my kids sometimes, thou shalt not whine. Leviticus, the whole book. Thou shalt not whine. Exodus, the whole book. And get the picture. Stop whining. We as people love to whine about things. We get in the, uh, the car. We turn on the radio station, and if we don't have Sirius XM, which we don't want to pay the money for, we could if we wanted to, but we turn on Sirius XM, and we skip that, and we go to the regular radio, and if we're driving like most people with regular radio, we get static when it goes from one station to another. And we go, I can't stand this static. I really wanted to hear this, and all it is is static. Then we turn to a station that has a song, and we don't like the song, and legitimately we go, I don't like that song. I wish they played a nice song. We turn it from there, and then we turn off the radio, and there's a guy that cuts us off in traffic. We whine. We go, ah, I cannot stand that. Now, that's not sighing over the heavenly. That's just whining. Then we get to the McDonald's. We get in the drive through line. They say, I'm sorry, we don't have fries today. You don't have fries? What kind of place is this? I'm going to Burger King. We get to Burger King. We get in line. You see where I'm going with this? Americans whine a lot. They get into the Burger King line. I'm not through yet. And the lady says, um, yes, I can make that your way. Exactly your way. This is Burger King. I go, thank you. You've made my day. We get home, we whine at the cat, the dog, and the husband and wife and the kids because they didn't make it our way. They forgot the onions. You want onions? I'll give you onions, says God. What did they complain about when they left Egypt? They said, we don't have the melons, the cucumbers, the onions, and the garlic. He says, I'll give you so much quail, it'll come out your nostrils. And it did. And they died. And he named the town Kibrath Hatava, which means graves of craving. Could the people have been very American-like at that time? Oh, yeah. Could they have been very westernized? Oh, yeah. But the size of Jesus were not Jesus whining. They were not instances of him complaining about the people. He loved the people. He cared about the people. And so when we look at Jesus, sighing isn't whining. And we are to constantly remind ourselves, thou shalt not whine. Well, that's our lesson, the size of Jesus, a little bit different type of lesson, I'm sure. Uh, I was composing this lesson, and I was borderlining on whining because of it, because as I composed the lesson, my phone ate, literally ate the lesson, had to get a new phone, got a new phone. They told me, oh yeah, all the data will be transferred, it ate it. And I re-got the lesson through an email because another preacher had said, can I have your information from this lesson because I want to preach it. So I was like, okay, let's see if I can go to the email and find how to find part of my notes. So this is a reconstruction lesson about the size, and I lost the lesson, had to go find the lesson, go find it back and backtrack through it to get it. But that's kind of an interesting irony, isn't it? I'm going, should I be whining about this? No. What if I already preached it and it's like not... 
but maybe I preached it the first three weeks I was there, and somehow I forgot about it. Don't worry about it. Preach the lesson. Don't whine about it. You can sigh, but make sure your sighs are for what's right. What are you sighing about? Aren't you sighing to get to heaven? Because in the world in which we live in, we need to be sighing to get to heaven. Lord, come quickly. The world doesn't get it, but if we keep pressing on, they can see Jesus living in us, hopefully. Or if the world doesn't get it, hopefully we can give the gospel message to the world. And we need to be sighing for heaven. We need to be longing to get to heaven. Take a deep breath. Exhale. Release the stress. Say, I want to get there, and I want everybody I possibly can to help get there, go to heaven too. And so the sighs of Jesus help us understand, yes, sighing's natural. It's natural from time to time to just be puzzled by the enigmatic phraseology and terms and deeds of us and others. It's time that we recognize Jesus was not, not only, we say sometimes Jesus was tempted like in every way as we are yet without sin. And I think we sometimes make it sound like he was only tempted in physical pleasures yet without sin. But in this instance, he's tempted like us in every way yet without sin in that he physically sighed, but he didn't let his sighs go on to whining. He physically dealt with stressors in life, but he didn't let it ruffle his feathers so much that he just became despondent to the point of, of, I guess we would basically just say, building a complaint box in his mind. Jesus didn't complain to the Heavenly Father. And so as we look at this topic, we want you to be a Christian and know that, yes, Jesus understands you, but he also gives you an ability to hear and believe him Repent of your sins, confess of your, of your Savior, be immersed for the salvation of your soul, and live faithfully to God. If we can help you do that in accordance with Acts 2.38 and Acts 22.16, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.